Just a little hug, okay? <laughs> Pastor Erwin Lutzer, who at the Moody Memorial Church in Chicago, has written a book on heaven entitled, One Minute After We Die. In chapter 4, he quotes a man that uh, I knew in uh, the 1970s. He was beginning a ministry in our community there and became known as Life Action Ministry. But Del Fazenfeld went home to be with the Lord at a young age. And... Lutzer interviewed him and he said when Dell was battling a rare brain tumor, the doctors assured him in April he would be dead before Christmas. When I interviewed him, he told me he wanted to follow God so fully while he still had strength that when weakness came, he would be able to endure his suffering with confidence. Then he made this comment, when you come home at night, you can manage to get around the house in the darkness because you've been there so often in the light. And when Dell went home to be with the Lord in November of that year, those who were, who were with him report that he died well. And that's, of course, John Wesley said that about the Methodist, right? Our people die well. And we certainly wouldn't need the legislature to do as they did this past week, uh, pass a law about uh, the right to die and all those things. But I believe God does amazing things in those la that very last chapter of life. I've seen it so many times as a pastor. And people walking with God and in that chapter, finding out and doing things with others and with God is certainly important. But Lutzer went on to add this statement. What can we expect one minute after we die? And that, of course, is the title of the message today. And I'm going to try to look at two pictures in the, in the New Testament so we can get a, a better understanding. And, and I'm using the phrase, and, and Randy Alcorn uses it, intermediate heaven, differ, to differentiate it from the ultimate heaven. Now, please, you know, don't quibble on this. Uh, don't do as we had a couple of professors, one at Trinity Seminary and one from Dallas that took the ministerial through some agony back in the 80s when the prof from Dallas was really going after the prof from Trinity who was talking about the physical resurrection body of Jesus. I mean, we're, we're speculating here in this period of time, okay? So please humor me and allow me to use this phrase intermediate because that's what I want to see. And we see two pictures today that will help us understand it a little more clearly. The first one we're going to look at is in Luke 16, if you want to head there while I'm giving a background. And this is uh, Jesus talking about one, life one minute after death before his resurrection. Now, that's important to note, before his resurrection. But he does it in a parable. And Jesus was the master at telling parables. Parables are stories. You, you uh, want to get the big picture, the, the principles from the story. You don't want to make a parable walk on all fours as some people try to do, those of us who believe in the literal interpretation of Scripture, uh, the, the rallying cry I've heard many years in hermeneutics class, how to interpret Scripture, is when the common sense makes, when the literal sense makes common sense, seek no other sense. But keeping in mind, the Bible is filled with all kinds of literature, and we have to handle that literature differently. And a parable certainly is one of those. And we, we're not looking at every word, but we're trying to see what is Jesus teaching us in this. One of the unique things about the parable is Jesus uses the name of a person. He uses the name Lazarus, and we can be confused with that if we're not careful. We think, well, ah, must be the Lazarus he raised from the dead. No, there are two different Lazaruses. The one he raised from the dead was obviously a wealthy man, but this one is a very poor man who's died. So in Luke 16 and verse 19, we read, There was a rich man who was press, dressed, in, <laughs> dressed in purple and fine linen and live, lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment. 
He looked up and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to, there, to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. For Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Now, this is an amazing parable, and I'd like to observe several things from it. <clears throat> and this is something all of us need to remember, especially those of us who may be a little closer to the final chapters of life. But you, you never know, do we? I mean, we, we don't know when our number is up and when the bell will toll for us. But uh, we're all one breath away from stepping into eternity. But here, we see that the angels come and usher us in to the next uh, experience that we have. So there's, there's nothing to fear. But it, it may happen at any time. I was flying back from Colorado Springs one night and... Uh, the woman beside me was flying back from Spokane, Washington, and she had flown out there to celebrate her grandmother's 100th birthday. On the day before her birthday, her grandmother died. And you just don't know. The lady took comfort saying, well, if you count the, you know, the time she was in the womb, she did make it, at least did make 100. But you just never know, do we? But there's nothing for the child of God to fear because we have angels that will usher us home and receive a rich welcome. Remember what Peter writes about that in, in, in Second Peter, that the seven Christian virtues, we should furnish these to our faith so that we'll re receive a warm welcome when we step into eternity to be with God. But we go there. Now here Jesus is picturing them together. The, the hell or torment or Hades as, as we find, or Sheol in the Old Testament, it's there. Now look at some characteristics of this. Abraham and Lazarus are there. And by inference, you could probably say there are others who are in the forever family of God. Now in the Old Testament, it was not just Jewish people who were saved. It was overwhelmingly Jewish. But remember Job, probably the oldest book in the Bible, he was not a Jew. Uh, remember Jonah, he got into trouble because he didn't want any of those uh, Ninevites to be converted and he knew God would be gracious and God did. So it wasn't just Jewish people, it was whoever's in the forever family of God. But here we have Abraham and Lazarus are together. But notice the rich man, he's all alone. Please, you know, I, I said last week, hell is not anything to joke about. Uh, it's just not. I mean, it's not going to be a place of community, a place where all of our friends are. That's not what we face here. And remember, Jesus is talking more about hell than he's talking about heaven, and he's describing for us what's there. And it's a place of isolation. And in this period, and I call it intermediate, before the final events unfold, and we see in the book of the Revelation that from chapter 4 on to the end of the book, things that are unfolding that he has to have a physical body. You see, when you die, you're not a disembodied spirit. I've heard, and I just heard this recently, some people talking about their spirit is with us. Now, their spirit is not here. When you step into eternity, your spirit isn't back here on planet Earth. You're not a disembodied spirit. You're a physical body. Notice he says, take his, the tip of his finger and dip it into water and give me something to drink. We have physical bodies in that next, I call it upgrade, when we step into eternity, and we'll explore that in, in the next few weeks. But we, we will ultimately get the glorified, resurrected bodies. But you see, this period, one minute after we die, 
It's transitional. It's waiting for the, the rapture, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the great white throne judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, the millennial reign, and all of those events. And so during that, we're not disembodied spirits. Now, here's something fantastic. I mean, this is really amazing to notice. Did you notice what the rich man said? The rich man, all of a sudden, is interested in missions and evangelism, isn't he? <laughs> Send them back and get my brothers saved. I mean, unfortunately, it's hard for some of us Christians to get cranked up about missions and evangelism, but here, there's no doubt about it. I mean, he, he said, I, I see the problem, and I don't want my brothers to come here. Send somebody. Now notice, he's not cursing God. He's not angry at God. Somehow he sees the justice of God in this experience. The sovereignty of God. The, the holiness of God. See, I think we have such a low view of God today. We don't think theologically in our culture at all. And we have such a low view of God. But he understood. I mean, it's like, you know, C.S. Lewis says, you know, we have all these questions here on planet earth and he said but as soon as we step into eternity and our eyes are open we'll say but of course <laughs> we'll see it from God's perspective and here the the rich man even though he's in torment and agony he's not cursing God he understands the sovereignty of God the justice of God and he even expresses that but notice that another thing there's no second chance. Abraham doesn't even say to this guy, you can get out of there if you want. And, and you know, this, this challenges two things, I think. One, there is a strain of universalism that's coming back into evangelicalism that everybody will be saved. Well, Jesus is talking here. Jesus is the one who's giving us this picture of life after death. And there's no second chance. You know, some people say, well, if you really see what, what is facing in hell, you'll, you'll change your mind. And you'll, you'll want a second chance. There is no second chance. He's not giving this rich man a second chance. And the value of this story in Luke 16 is this is what happened to people one minute after they died before Christ's resurrection. Okay? And the the saved would go to Abraham's bosom. The unsaved would be described as in torment. Now let's look at the second picture of life after death and Je after Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Remember when he was on the cross and the thief on the cross said, obviously repented. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say you have to go and, and be baptized or join a church or something else, did he? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. And so we know, as Paul teaches in Philippians, that when a believer dies, he or she departs and are with Christ. One minute after we die, we're ushered in by the angels into the presence of our Lord. And we know that that's true. Well, let's look at how this is described. And again... This is interesting in Revelation chapter 6. Now, as you're on your way over to Revelation 6, now, I, I, uh, my interpretation of Revelation is I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. I mean, if you don't agree with that, that we're, that's not a test of fellowship. But I say after, in chapter 4, the church is raptured by our Lord and the, uh, the events unfold after that. But in chapter 6, we see an interesting scene in verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. Notice, they called out in a loud voice in unison, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge your blood. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. <clears throat> now, wow, this is a, a lot of stuff here to unpack, but this is showing life after death for the believer. Obviously, these are the tribulation saints uh, from my perspective, the pre-tribulation, but... <clears throat> 
Look at what they're saying in verse 9. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They had been on earth and maintained that testimony. And they were killed for the cause of Christ. Now, notice the continuity here. And this is an important principle we'll, we'll come back to it near the end of the message today. But they're aware of what had happened on planet earth. Now, I don't think they're seeing. You know, I often hear people say, well, my mother is up there watching me. Now, I don't think that's true. I don't think you can substantiate that. I think they're aware of what's happening on planet earth. Just as these saints, they're wondering, how long? When are you going to avenge our blood? They're understanding that. But there's a continuity because they saw what had happened on planet Earth and now they're still there. Now, notice, they have emotions. See, another reason I say this is, this is before the ultimate because in Revelation 20 and 22, we have that statement that many people misquote it at funeral services. Well, so-and-so, there's no more pain and no more sorrow and all that. Uh, that's not yet. I mean, because here the saints are looking back and they're seeing the pain and the agony on planet Earth and they're still having those emotions that are part of our being. And so they're struggling with that. They're aware of what has happened. And they call out in a loud voice. And they hear individuals crying out together, How long, sovereign God? They have robes, individual, which indicates there's some sort of a physical body. Not the glorified resurrected body yet, which we'll get, but they have these bodies that are there. And their understanding of what's happening still on planet Earth, there's a cognizance of it and awareness of that. Now the phrase, how long, indicates that there's time in heaven, isn't there? Now, th this is where I won't go into the weeds. I said I'm, I'm doing this is from a pastoral perspective because a lot of reading I've done on this, you go into the weeds on this, especially theology books and, and all. And even uh, Arthur Custance has a great work on time and eternity, even that. You get into the weeds. But there is a difference between time and eternity, right? I mean, you, you can't be in both at the same time. <laughs> Excuse that. But... Nevertheless, there's some kind of sequence in heaven. I mean, they're talking, they're, they even sing, as you'll see in a, uh, the rest of this chapter. And, and singing connotes sequence, right? I, I still remember when I studied piano, my piano teacher would hammer with the, the metronome after me, you know, get, get into one, one, the timing and all of that. There's sequence, there's time. But this is in eternity and in heaven. That they were cognizant. And notice their concept of God. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, that you will judge and avenge. You see, they had a clear thinking on who God is. Remember I quoted Chuck Swindoll. He says, our problem is not that we think logically. You know, we, we, we pride ourselves in education today and thinking logically. But the problem is we do not think theologically. We don't understand this. And we make, just like our lawmakers made this law this past week, passed this law this past week. They're not thinking theologically and the implications of, of what a person, why a person has to grapple with death in the last few months. I still remember reading the, the testimony of David Brainerd, who died in the home of Jonathan Edwards. Over six months, he was just dying. And just the things that happened to him. Read his testimony if you want to get an insight into that of, how God worked in his life in those last days of life. <clears throat> but anyway, we see this. What is true of these saints here is true of you and me. One minute after we die. We have an awareness of what's still happening on planet Earth. We're in robes and we're wondering. And we say, you know, the number there is until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were killed has been completed. You see, God not only has your days numbered, you know, you and I are invincible and immortal until our number is up, right? Now, I've, I've tried to bargain with God that I want 336,000 days, which would put me right around 100 years old. But I don't know that that'll happen. 
I mean, I'd rather the Lord come before that, but uh, we don't know. But we all have a d our days are numbered, and we shouldn't tamper with that. We should allow that to work out and play out. But it's also the number of those who are suffering. See, God understands this, and God is involved in the process. So those are the two pictures of one minute after we die. And as I said, I use the idea, I, and it's, it helps me, I hope it doesn't confuse you, but that I call it, well, this period from the time the believer dies and until the events are unfolded in the Revelation 20 and 22. Even though we are in eternity in heaven, there's still this period that I, I choose to call an intermediate heaven until the, the new heavens and the new earths that Peter describes. And we're limited and in, in challenged in our language here. And, and as I said, we surely shouldn't argue over this, over whether we believe in intermediate heaven or what, but it's the ultimate destination and where we're going to go. Now, there are two invalid assumptions I had before I studied heaven. One was this. I kind of, you know, blew it all together and didn't really think much about what happened with those Revelation 4 through 22, that period after all of us will either be dead or raptured and the, the events unfold. So there's a difference there to understand. But the second one, and, and Randy Alcorn was helpful to me on this, the, the idea of continuity from this life to the next. You see, the, the Bible opens up with what? A garden, right? In Eden. It closes with a garden. You see the, the balance here and the symmetry and the beauty here. And, and the idea is that when we go from one phase to the next, there's a continuity of all that's good, all that's true, all that's beautiful, all that's right will continue on into the next. For example, when Adam and Eve sinned and I love, you know, when God came to them. Wasn't that cool of Adam to say, well, it was the woman you gave me? And it was just as cool for Eve to say, well, it was that devil. <laughs> what happens when, when we've sinned, we blame others, don't we? And we're so self-centered and we're, we're wrapped up in ourselves and all that stuff. But nevertheless, when Adam and Eve came out of the garden, they still look like human beings. They, they carried that with them. And the same when you and I go from this life to the next. And we'll explore this more in depth in the weeks ahead. But we carry with us these things that are right and true and good. And we'll simply be upgraded. I'll talk about the number of upgrades that a, a human being goes through before he or she is into eternity. But that's that continuity that happens and transpires. Now, as we've looked at these two pictures today of what life will be like one minute after we, de we die, I hope most of you have been asking, where am I going to be one minute after I die? Where are you going to be? Are you going to be in a place of torment as a rich man? Or in a place of blessing and community and relationships as Lazarus was? Beloved, if it's torment, again, I underscore, there's no second chance. There's no, you know, oh, I didn't like this. Anyway, God, give me another chance. It's not going to happen. Just as Jesus, and Jesus is the one who would have said something about that, if it were possible. But it's real, and I hope none of you experiences that. Or will you be in paradise with the Lord, to depart and to be with Christ? And as I said, these things that I'm sharing with you, you we may not agree on, on all the things, but the important thing, we're with the Lord. We're there. We've, we've made the right decision. And it's all because of the Lord. It isn't because of religion or anything else, is it? It's knowing where we're going before we step into eternity. And knowing Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. It's not other gods. You know, this past week we, we were reminded of 9-11. Of 
And I can still remember after that first Tuesday, standing in the pulpit on Sunday and saying, our politicians do not understand what's going on. Now, that's not unusual. They don't understand what's going on anyway. But they don't understand the seriousness of this issue. And to this day, I mean, it's even worse, isn't it, what we're seeing, how we handle this issue. And it's all about Jesus. It isn't about other gods or other religions. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ and knowing him. And I want to see every one of us there one minute after we die. And so, again, I'll bring us back. It's important as we start a journey of reflecting on heaven and seeking heaven that we know that we're going to be there. You know, if there's any doubt, just as my, one of my heroes, Charles Spurgeon, said, you know, if, if it's 10 o'clock in the morning and you, you couldn't remember if you ate breakfast, you ought to eat it again. And I think he ate quite a few breakfasts in that, you know, his short rotund dude. But are you certain that you have that relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ? Do you know that? I mean... I hope you're not, st I mean, if you're seeking, I'm glad you're here, but you can settle that issue today. The whole thing of heaven. Jesus came to purchase a place in heaven for all of us. You see, if he, all of us would have gone to hell until we repent and come to Jesus. And so I would encourage you, pray with me in a moment that you can do that. Because, you see, none of us knows, right? Just like that woman flying back from Spokane and her grandmother never made her 100th birthday to celebrate the day before. Wow. I've had funerals of people. One, I remember distinctly one man came out and said, Pastor Dave, I need to see you this week. We set up an appointment for Wednesday. He stepped into, into eternity on Tuesday. You never know. So make sure that you understand that. And then once we do, let's keep on seeking heaven together. Okay, let's pray. For any who are here today that you, you're not certain if you were to die tonight, you'd go to heaven. But you'd like to settle the issue using the whole topic of heaven to be a springboard into knowing where you're going. If you desire to do that, pray this prayer silently, sincerely with me. We'll not embarrass you in any way, but we do want to help you in the spiritual journey. But this is the prayer that you can re say silently in your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. I confess I'm a sinner. I thank you for the gift of eternal life. Be my Savior and Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these two pictures of what one minute after we die, what we'll experience. And God, my heart's prayer for this congregation is that every one of us would be there one minute after he or she steps into eternity. So continue to bless us and use us, and especially as we're thinking about this, that we're not doing it to be so heavenly-minded we're no earthly good, but we're just thinking accurately about it so we can impact planet Earth in a more effective and fruitful way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.